morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to all of our Grace Church family, and a special welcome to everyone from First Presbyterian Church Danville who is joining us today. A uh, little housekeeping announcement. Um, if you are trying to view this on YouTube or know someone who is trying to view this on YouTube, I couldn't get it to work. So call them, text them, say, hey, tune in on Facebook Live, because that's the only place it's going to be. Super fun. I will, however, after this service is over, do my best to post this recording onto our YouTube page. So if you are a person or know a person who does not get Facebook or would like to sample it on YouTube, um, you'll simply have to wait just a few hours so I can get it up and going. I appreciate your patience and flexibility and all of this technical things that we're doing. It really is a pleasure to have all of you who are tuning in joining us today. Um, it is my ardent hope for everyone that the service of prayer and praise will bring you peace and hope and comfort and inspiration and the worshiping of our God. Now before we begin, I'd like for us all to just take a moment, take a breath, shake off all of the technical difficulties, all of our worries, all of our concerns, and prepare our hearts to come to worship the Lord. Let us pray. Planting God, you are fostering growth in every heart. Help us, Lord, to cultivate what you plant. Help us to live fruitful lives, seeking to sow seeds of justice, mercy, grace, and love wherever we go. May we approach your throne this morning ready to empty the fields of our minds so that our worship will create in us a fertile field, ready for tilling and planting and growing. Amen. I invite you all who are with us to join us in singing our first hymn. Um, if you don't have a hymnal or don't know the words, it is found in a previous post on Facebook page. Uh, just the one right before our live stream. You can look at it and um, view all of the words there. We will be singing God of the Fertile Fields. <laughs> Please join me in the call to confession. 
Confessing our sins to God is like weeding the garden. It must be done early and often if we expect there to be growth. Let us then do the hard work of confessing our sins to God. Please, when prompted, say, forgive us, O Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we want to grow in faith as long as that faith does not interfere too much with how we live our lives. Forgive Amen. us, O oh Lord. Lord, we want to grow in love, unless it means we have to love people we don't like. Forgive, Forgive us, O oh Lord. Lord, we want to grow in grace, unless that means our graciousness becomes thankless and goes unrecognized. Forgive, Forgive us, O oh Lord. Lord, we really do want to grow, but we tend to not want to experience the growing pains. Help us, Lord, to realize that when we grow in you, we labor in love. Forgive us for all the times we have not allowed your seed to take root. Forgive us for all the times we have not sown the seeds of your grace you have given us to share. Help us, O oh God to let go of all that is stopping us from bearing good fruit for your kingdom. Please hear the assurance of forgiveness. Friends of God, creation, sees great things in you. Even though we do not always recognize the gifts we are given, the opportunities we have to learn, the ways in which we need to grow, the Lord our God continues to give, create, and cultivate grace for us every day. Let us give thanks to God, for in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Let us join now in our responsive song, For the Fruit of All Creation.
than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn come up to the cypress, instead the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our second reading today is from Matthew 13, chapter, verses 1 through 23. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into the boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seeds, fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Then the disciples came and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, You will indeed listen, but never understand. And you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes, so that they may not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, your ears, for they hear. Truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for it immediately received it with joy, yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while, and when trouble or persecution arises on the account of the word, the person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of the wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. But, for as, but as for what was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields. In one case, a hundredfold, another sixty, another thirty. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Candy. Over the next few weeks, uh, we will be talking a lot about Jesus' parables in Matthew. Jesus was pretty fond of the parables, as a lot of speakers are. You see, parables allow a speaker the freedom to connect two things that are seemingly unlike. 
They also present an easy and nice way for a speaker to maybe address certain issues that might anger a crowd in a very safe and analogous way. Jesus himself, being a bridge between humanity and divinity, came easy to speaking in parables. Yet, sometimes for us who are mere mortals, parables can get kind of confusing. We might interpret them very, very wrong. So I want to talk a little bit about what a parable is. Merriam-Webster defines a parable as a usually short, fictitious story that illustrates a moral attitude or religious principle. Pretty good, pretty good definition. But I also want to talk a little bit about the word parable and where that comes from in the Greek. The Greek word parable meaning means to throw alongside. So a parable then is something that is thrown alongside our own reality and culture. That's something that illustrates some sort of guidance for us in an analogous way. But parables are still tricky. We can get stuck in just one form of that analogy. We can get stuck in just one way of interpreting the parable. Which is funny because I really think that Jesus taught in parables because there are a lot of ways to interpret them. You know, I know in our history that has sometimes meant that that folks can use their interpretation of a parable to say what they want in a very eisegetical way, where we take the scripture and we use it to prove our point, rather than proving God's. As Presbyterians, a good rule of thumb is to adhere to the rule of love. It means that all things in the gospel have to hold to one solid truth. What God has done God has done out of love for all his creation. I know that Jesus had something in mind when teaching all of his parables, but I still believe that he wanted us to struggle with them. I believe that Jesus wanted his followers to think critically about these stories because there's always so much that can be gained. Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to many things, not just the sower, not just the wheat and the tares, not just a widow uh, giving a coin, not just a mustard seed, not just all of the things that he compares the kingdom of heaven to. And I think he does this because the kingdom of heaven, like all things created by God, are both perfectly simple and beautifully complex. Jesus uses so many parables because the kingdom of heaven is not just a like one thing. It is a like many things. Our parable for today, however, is rather fitting for this definition of being thrown alongside. It is the parable of the sower and how the seed is being thrown alongside. In our parable for this morning, we have a sower who, if you ask me, seems a little cavalier about where they're throwing their seeds. They don't really see much to care where it lands. They just scatter them all over. Now Jesus tells the parable, or tells the people, that many of these seeds will not end up making it. They won't end up taking root. Some will be gobbled up by greedy birds. Some will fall along rocky soil, unable to root deeply. Some will be sown among thorns and weeds where they'll be unable to survive and unable to sustain. So even if you're not a master gardener, this story makes sense. We know that a seed needs good soil to root and grow. But we all know as well that there are a lot of obstacles to growth. I want to take a moment and reflect on the scripture that Jesus never scolds the sower. He doesn't correct the sower for throwing their seeds around willy-nilly, for not taking the time to diligently plant and care for where they're putting each little seed. Well, it's not the 
was so her fault. See, in this story, he or she has only one responsibility. To sow as many seeds as possible. Rather, it is the soil that makes all of the difference. Now, Jesus tells us that in this analogy of how the Word of God takes root in each of us, we are this soil, right? This is what Jesus points out in his interpretation of the parable. But before Jesus explains this parable to his disciples, he talks a lot about how people never really understand what he's saying. That's verses 11 through 15. Again, it's one of those times that the lectionary really wanted me to take out those verses because they don't like it when Jesus tells us that I'm going to tell you what this means, but you're still not going to get it. There are many times who, that we all, we all who have the very best intentions, the most gracious and Jesus-filled hearts can take the word of God and misunderstand it. It's kind of like when you plant a tree and you plant it just a little bit crooked. You know, it doesn't much matter in the beginning. You don't really notice it. But then when the roots establish and it continues to grow a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper, you begin to see that it is just a little bit off. Now it's easy to read into this parable and see that there are many people in this world who are just rocky soil. It's easy to point to our neighbor and tell ourselves, well, that guy's full of weeds. It's also easy for us to blame all of our misdeeds on the devils that steal away our seed. But none of that interpretation is very helpful for us today. In fact, I kind of think that the very last thing we need in this world is more dirty names to throw at one another. So I'm going to offer this interpretation as well. We each are every type of soil, simultaneously and at different parts of our lives. Sometimes in our life, we become far more preoccupied with worldly matters than to be concerned about the Word of God and the instruction we get from Christ. At those times, we are like the thorny ground being choked out by the weeds that are the cares of this world. There are also some subjects in which we are so assured that our way is the best, we will simply not entertain correction. And those places were a little bit rocky. And at any time, and at any place, we are subject to the wiles of the adversary. Those voices that come to confuse and snatch away the belovedness that we have tried so hard to sow into our hearts. We are all of these things. We each are all of these soils, probably more times in our life than we care to admit. But we're not just the soil in this parable. We're also the sowers. And I know you're probably thinking, wait, wait, wait. Jesus is the sower in this parable, right? He's the one that's planting the word. Come on, that's a bad interpretation. Jesus said it, he's the sower. But Jesus isn't the one spreading the word of God. Jesus is the incarnate word of God. Christ is the seed. And it is Christ's grace and love and justice and mercy that we must try our best to allow to take root in us. Remember, at the beginning of this parable, I want you to remember who Jesus is talking to when he's saying this parable. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the people that he is sending out to spread the word of God. And this parable we who claim to be disciples of God are both all of the different types of soil and the sower. We must take care to tend our hearts, to keep them rock-free 
to keep them rid of, of weeds and thorns, to scare away those pesky, evil thoughts that rob us of the seeds that have taken root. It's our job to provide fertile soil for the Word of God to change us. But at the same time, it is also our sacred responsibility to further plant the Word in the minds and hearts of our brothers and sisters in all the times in their life, not knowing if they're having a rocky sort of day or if that seed just might spring up and bear fruit. You see, the rub is that we never really know. That's part of the mystery of our faith. And in part, it's what is addressed in Isaiah. For God's ways are higher than our ways. If we, God's children, are the soil and the sower, I want to ask and, and Christ is the seed, I want to ask you what is left in this equation of growing and planting and all of these things. What is left if we sow the seeds and we are the soil and Christ is this wonderful seed that is planted? There are a few other things that make seeds grow. There's sun and there's water. And those things are that beautiful mystery of God's grace and mercy and justice, because even in the most deserted places, even in the driest and most temperate climates, grass can grow. Cedar trees can root through boulders. And the only one who knows who and where and why and how is God. It is not for us to know, to be sure if the word that we plant is actually going to grow in someone's heart. So what do we do? What do we do when it's so uncertain that anything that we might be trying to do, that any seeds we might be throwing out could just fall on rocky soil, could just be eaten up by birds? What do we do? We get really cavalier with our seeds. That's what we do. We spread them out far and wide and lavishly. For we never know when the great mystery of God is going to shine upon that seed. When God's great mystery is going to allow the drops of rain to dig deeper, to wash away the stone, to plant that seed in more fertile soil. It is God's grace that allows the seed to take root. I'd like to end our sermon today by a poem from Steve Garnis Holmes and his blog, Unfolding Light. Uh, this poem was also given out in your devotionals this week, but I think, as so often I come to think, that there are some people who say something way better than I can. So I'm just going to go with what he has to say about this. His, his poem is titled, Sewing. The candle doesn't trouble itself with the journey of light. The bird doesn't care who hears. Beloved, you will waste many seeds. You will offer kindness unnoticed. You'll try 70 times to forgive and fail, and those you forgive will not repent. You love the undeserving and unappreciative. You try to get close to me, yet you feel no closer, and your prayers fall on rocky ground. My child, how much of my grace do you suppose falls amongst thorns? Beloved, it is of the mystery of your faith that you cannot know the life of the seeds you sow. How far away, how much later, in whose unseen heart your love bears fruit, thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. 
Do not measure. Do not judge. So light. So light. Amen. <clears throat> Please join in the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into the hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please, all you who are watching and who are here, join in singing our last hymn, uh, number 308, if you have a hymnal. It is entitled, God in Whom All Life Begins.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are one body of Christ. One body that is struggling to remember who we are, to adjust to new ways of worship. We pray, O oh God, that you remind us in palpable, palpable feeling. Your church is not made up of one building, that your church is not made up of one people's, but it is made in every heart that proclaims the name of Christ as Lord. We pray, O oh God, that you would help us to join together that you would help us all who are struggling to find what church means in this new world. That you would bring us together and foster us in our growth. That we may bear good fruit for God. We pray also, O oh Lord, for this world. Knowing, O oh God, that in every place and every time we have felt the pains of pestilence, the pains of pandemic. God, we pray that you would be with those families who are separated, that you would be with the people in this world, oh God, afraid to go out for good reason, that you would help us and keep us, that you would unite us all, O oh Lord, reminding us that this is not just in one place, but in every place. We lift up our prayers also, O oh God, for the nations. Where every nation is dealing with many similar things, O oh God, we pray for the leaders, the leaders of all nations, that our leaders might remember whom they serve, that our leaders might approach our leadership, O oh God, with a gracious and Christ-filled heart, knowing that you came to serve and not be served. Lord God, we pray that in all of our nations, good fruit would be sown and harvested for the coming of your kingdom. We pray, O oh God, also for this community, Lord, we pray that you lift up this community. Church family, First Presbyterian Church of Danville. We pray that you would lift up Winona. And Danville too, I can pray for them, that's my home. We pray, oh God, that you would help us all to see the places in our community that need us, to fill the needs that we see. We pray, God, that you would make us like a city upon a hill, that you would help us to unite and to better this community, to strengthen the faith of our communities, and to sow good seed everywhere we may go. And lastly, O oh Lord, we pray for our loved ones. We pray, O oh God, for all of those who have fallen ill to this pandemic. We pray, oh God, for all of those who have fallen ill outside of this pandemic. God, there is so much healing that needs to be done in this world. And we pray for the physical healing of those whom we love, whom we know are suffering and hurting. We pray also, Lord, for the spiritual healing of your people. In times of uncertainty, we find it hard to trust that you know what you're doing. And we pray, oh God, that we can continue to live in your mystery. That we can feel your presence with us. And that you would show all of the people whom we love, our love for them, and your deep and abiding agape the love that only you can show. Gracious God, we pray all of these things. We pray them earnestly, and we pray them in every way that we can from our hearts and our heads. 
and we pray them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as you go out into this world, or stay in into this world, as you do all of the things that you are doing, I invite you to question that this week. Ask yourself what seeds you are sowing and what soil you have within you as well. Go forth and sow light, dear friends, and take this blessing with you. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you until we meet again. Amen.